is April 10th, 1997, and we're on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. My name is David Knott. I'm the faculty advisor for the Ball State Daily News. I'm also a past president of College Media Advisors. During the past few years, CMA has attempted to record its history. We discovered in the process that very little uh, information is, was recorded or written about the organization as early as in its early years. We know, of course, that CMA was founded as the National Council of College Publications Advisors in 1954. We also know that one of its earliest members was Dr. Lewis E. Engelhardt, Professor Emeritus of Journalism at Ball State University. In an effort to fill in some of the gaps in the recorded history of CMA, Dr. Engelhardt has agreed to share with us some of his recollections today uh, about the uh, early days of the organization. Dr. Engelhardt, when did you first join the NCCPA? The second year of its existence, they had a national convention of the Associated Collegiate Press in uh, Cleveland. I had read a little note in the Journalism Quarterly about the organization of the thing, and uh, I decided that that would be a group that I should become acquainted with. The fellow named Arthur Sanderson was in charge. He was the first president? No, no, no. he was the first executive secretary. Executive secretary. And I, he was working for uh, Fred Kildow at the University of Minnesota at the time. So I went over to Cleveland and met some nice people and it was very enjoyable. And from then on, I've been associated with it ever since. What are some of the leadership positions you've held in the CCPA and CMA? For a long while, I was uh, chairman of the research committee. Then I became chairman of the press law committee. And more recently, I've been the liaison person for CMA with the First Amendment Congress. Can, can you uh, can you tell us about some of the uh, people who were uh, who played major roles in getting this organization started in the, early, in the mid '50s, and uh, maybe some of the things that they did, or some of the things that the organization did, and happened to to become a viable unit? Well, everybody did everything out of their hip pocket and where they kept their wallet because they financed everything themselves. Although Fred Kildow was very generous and popping for some meals for us, the uh, organization met from time to time. And of course, in the early days, there weren't all that many people who uh, were involved. Uh, one of the first people I met was John Boyd, who uh, is now uh, retired. He taught at Indiana State University for many years, and he lives in Terre Haute. Sometimes he goes to Florida, but not too often anymore. Uh, Derry Apolitella was uh, involved very much. And those were the two that I worked with most, although there were other people all along the line that I knew. I knew all the presidents and uh, worked with them and talked with them and second-guessed them and encouraged them. But I had uh, other duties at Ball State besides those associated with uh, the student publications. And as a result, I didn't dare become too involved as uh, an officer or something like that. The uh, luxury of having light assignments never did appear at Ball State University. And the result is that we worked long, hard hours. And it was a joy to run away and go to a CMA convention. It was been a pleasant and a, a very good thing for us. What were some of the problems that uh, we had in, in the early days? Some of the issues maybe that they faced, either as advisors or as an organization? Well, getting reasonable rates of hotels and uh, getting uh, good uh, uh, speakers. We've always had the problem of a uh, practicing journalists coming in and saying, well, you don't need to study journalism in college. Uh, we can teach you that when you come to work for us. But then they never hire those kind of people. They hire people with journalism majors. Uh, we had the 
some uh, large journalism schools that felt associating with the student publications was beneath their dignity, and they didn't uh, participate very effectively. But uh, it was the uh, middle size and smaller schools, both uh, public and private, that got together and started bringing students to meetings and getting a program organized. For a long while, we had difficulties with uh, with the uh, uh, service agencies like ACP and uh, the Columbia Scholastic Press Association because they were going through some challenging times and they weren't as well organized to help the college level publications as we wished. Finally, through the work of Bill Flick, uh, president of CMA, we managed to develop contracts with those organizations that indicated what they would do and what we would do. Once those contracts were in place, everything flourished. The organizations grew in size, the programs grew greatly. Now it's hard to find a hotel big enough to accommodate all our delegates. And that's uh, really a, a magnificent growth factor that's happened in the last 15, 20 years. Were the, were the earliest uh, conventions uh, really attended only by faculty in the beginning? Uh, you no, mentioned that they brought students no, no. later. They, uh, the ACP is an Associated Collegiate Press, right. and they had programs for colleges. Uh, the Columbia Scholastic Press Association, Columbia University, had a had a, a college division. But uh, frankly, both of those groups uh, were more concerned about the high school levels than the college levels. But they did do the programming eventually then for the they did the, for the they did the, the programming, but it wasn't long until the faculty advisors, the CMA members, took over programming and made it amount to something. Um, who were some of the uh, early leaders of the group? Well, there were a tremendous number of them that uh, really did a marvelous job. Uh, we produced a, a written history of the organization, and it listened year by year, the officers, and they, they were uh, really worked pretty hard, most of them. Occasionally, if somebody was named to an office, and they wanted it in name only. But uh, they disappeared pretty quick, and uh, the officers worked hard, and uh, if you could uh, take a look at that long list of officers, you would find out who really persevered and did a great deal. And of course, then we have uh, some awards that CMA gives, and a whole list of them, and many people have been noticed how great their work has been. And you can see there have been good advisors and good uh, contributors to the work of CMA. We uh, uh, soon uh, got uh, to the point where we had two young women who really got us going great. One was Lillian Lodge Copenhaver, now an associate dean at the Florida University. The other one was Nancy Green, now an associate dean or dean at a uh, college in uh, Georgia. They took turns being presidents, and they stirred us up and really got some things going. Uh, they, uh, they really have accomplished a lot. Uh, I think Lillian is probably president of the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communications now. And she's been very active in the Society of Professional Journalists. So she has spread the word about college journalism. And Nancy has done that also, partly through her association with the Gannett newspaper people, where she served as a publisher uh, for some time, for Gannett papers. So those two made a tremendous contribution. Fortunately, they're still with us. The uh, greatest achievement, one of the great achievements that we had was saving the life of something called the Student Press Law Center. It was going through some real organization problems. 
group of us met. When was this? Well, that was about uh, 20 years ago, something like that. We met in uh, at uh, in Columbus, Ohio. And no, I'm sorry, we met in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Carolyn Hall, uh, who taught scholastic journalism at Ohio State University, presided over a meeting with Bob Knight and asked us to come to. Bob was ill and couldn't get there. But we met. Not the, not the Bob Knight. Not the basketball player, but the, the, good, the good Bob Knight was there. And he, uh, we met. And the problem was that the, the management of the Student Press Law Center wanted to keep it under their jurisdiction. And we didn't want them to. The uh, uh, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press said, well, we can provide a housing for you at no charge. But you'll have to pay your other expenses. Well, how much will they be? $15,000 a year. So we decided, well, we'll see what we could do. And uh, they, uh, everybody was about to give up on it, but six or seven of us met in the hall at lunchtime. And without any authority whatsoever, we pledged money from our organizations to raise the money to get the thing going. I pledged $3,000 from CMA, all on my own, and others pledged money. We, we raised the $15,000 in 15 minutes. And we waltzed back into the meeting and said, well, here's the money, let's do it. So we did it. And then we worked out contracts and agreements with the first, with the reporters committee, and uh, it's been really a wonderful uh, liaison with, the, with those people. Jane Kirkley, who is the head of the Reporters Committee, has been a good person to work with. And Mark Bittman is probably one of the best people we've ever had available. Fortunately, uh, when we got started, we hired a, a young man who was just a very hard worker, and he got the thing pretty well organized. And then he was a young lawyer who wanted to build his own life and practice, and he left after a while, and Mark took over. And he's been with us for a long time now, built a tremendous reputation and a great service agency. And we and those uh, other scholastic journalism groups got together and saved the Student Press Law Center, and it's helped it grow into a tremendous force to protect the rights and freedom of college student publications. Nearly, nearly everybody in, in college media advisors uh, knows you as a person who's been who's been primarily uh, interested in uh, free press and student rights, and student press rights. Uh, in the early days of the organization, back in the fifties, what kind of legal issues were there, or were there any legal issues with the college press? There, there were there were legal issues, and some of them are very similar to what we have now, because. Uh, we were all dealing with the minds of college administrators. They don't seem to change. They, no, they're pretty stolid yeah. and uh, public relations oriented. But we uh, we worked with them. You know, some of them were wonderful people. Right. Some of them were terrible tyrants. But over the years, I think we've produced better ones. And uh, they seem to be more understanding everywhere. Private colleges and public colleges like the uh, we had those kind of problems and of course we still have them because you know college presidents change they can't hold their job as long as basketball coaches can so the result is that you always have a new crop coming on and you have to educate them all and it takes a little while because probably the slowest learner you have on campus is a college president but uh, sooner or later we get them trained and they get off the back of the students and the students then proceed. Uh, about the time we think everything's going well, somebody puts out a stupid April Fool edition and then we have all kinds of fussing about that. I've tried to keep people from doing those things, but uh, I only advise, I don't demand. The result is that 
every once in a while they'll do it. Now, the thing that happened when that student breast law center got changed, Nancy Green and I became the voice of the student breast law center and tried to give legal counsel, uh, maybe in an illegal way, since neither one of us are inter our attorneys. But we talked to people and tried to tell them what to do next. And we helped quite a few. Uh, some we couldn't help, but uh, we we did those kind of things. It was wonderful the the kind of expressions that we had. I ended up on the student on the Freedom of Information Committee of the Sigma Delta Chi or the Student uh, Society for Professional Journalists, and I found that as a member of that committee, I could call a, an important publisher in every state of the union and say, Mr. Jones, that college over next door to your town is having trouble with the college president. Why don't you go over and visit with him and tell him you shouldn't do it that way, sir? And you know they did that. Now, they wouldn't pay attention to a little college professor, but they surely paid attention to big shot publishers. And those people gave themselves and helped straighten out lots of problems. So I've always had a soft spark for uh, publishers, right. the commercial papers. They're good people, generally speaking. Well, the reason I got into this is that uh, we had a wonderful man by the name of Reed Montgomery who knew press law. He was a journalism professor and he ended up being executive secretary of the South Carolina Press Association. He uh, started teaching a session about libel for our conventions. And he knew what he was doing, but he couldn't go to all of them. So they we were in Chicago, a snowy, bitter, cold day in Chicago at a convention. There were three attorneys that had agreed to come and talk about libel. And I, there were about 400 people in the room waiting for them. And they couldn't get through the snow hotel. They were late. And people were resting. And somebody came to me and said, do you know anything about it? And I said, well, some things. They said, why don't you go talk to them until those guys show up? So I went and started talking about libel. Talked for about uh, 20, 30 minutes, and along came my, these attorneys, so I disappeared, and they took over, and after the over, people said to me, well, we couldn't understand what the attorneys were talking about, but we could understand you. So that was an inspiration to me. So I began trying to push that sort of thing. We used to always have one session and press law, and libel always started it off, and people got so wrapped up in that we never got into any other topics. So we decided to split it up, and Reed Montgomery took the libel session, and I took the other thing session, and we did better. But now, in our, because of the number of people attending and the interest, they have a dozen or more sessions on press law matters, and they're well attended. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I was in the middle of all that planning. As a matter of fact, I begged him not to schedule me in more than about four or five sessions in a convention because I found I was going so many I couldn't have time to eat or say hello to anybody or do all those fun things. I was always in sessions. And they finally got me down to about four sessions at the conference. But fortunately, we have a lot of good people who can handle those things now. Mm -hmm. um, what in addition to uh, issues of, of legal matters, did the uh, CMA get involved in in terms of helping students? Well, there were several things. <laughs> One of the most interesting things was our relationship with the Associated Press. Some of the papers that were getting bigger started uh, publishing things, uh, general news as well as campus news, and they wanted to get Associated Press. You could get United Press International, and uh, you could get some other news services. But AP was the one we thought most of. But AP had some rival, had some problems. They they gave us uh, the service at a reduced rate. And that was fine. We were getting along well. But some of the town papers, where there was a large college with a large student daily, began objecting because they thought that was the competition was bad, and they tried to get the AP to uh, raise us the rates for everybody. You know, 
Nancy Green, and a dapper young advisor named David Knott, and I were formed into a committee to go to negotiate with the Associated Press in New York City over at Rockefeller Center. And for three or four years, we'd go over there. Every year, they had the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and we had to chomp through that, break through the lines, with Irishmen and policemen yelling at us to get to the Rockefeller Center. And we negotiated, and then they negotiated. And you know, they, they finally gave in to us, because our point was, where are you going to get people who are interested and able to go to work with the AP if they don't come from the college ranks? So let us use this. Let us get acquainted with it. And then you can recruit good people. Well, that uh, carried the day. As a matter of fact, lots of people going out of college journalism programs do go to the wire services. Several of our students have done that, and they've done very well indeed. That was a very interesting episode. Yeah, that was. Uh, that reminded me of, uh, you mentioned when we went to, to uh, AP in New York, reminded me of the first convention I attended of this organization, and that was at Columbia University. And uh, all of our sessions were to be held at the, at the campus of Columbia University. Do you remember that year and the kinds of things that well, we I, had? I don't remember that year exactly. I went there one year. I don't think you were there. Were you there that year? Uh, when, the, when the doors were all locked? Yeah. yeah Yes, I was. That was the first year. I went uh, into the little library to register, and they said, well, we don't know where that is. I said, what do you mean? And the fellow came over and said, well, here's a registration box. It's got some change in it and some forms, and it's supposed to be over in another building about a block away. And uh, why don't you go over there, and if anybody shows up, register them for us. I said, well, I might have gone with the money. Oh, surely you won't. Well, I went over there, found the rooms where we were supposed to go. They were all locked, and I had a terrible time getting anybody to unlock them because in New York City, people don't unlock doors just because somebody asks them to. Right. But we finally got them unlocked, and we got the thing going. Uh, another problem with, uh, in New York is that the, uh, the weather is so bad sometimes. It's so cold, miserably cold, and icy. One year we had an ice storm that was just awful. Uh, we had to worry about that. Another problem, things are expensive in New York City. They've always been expensive. Uh, another problem, um, it never bothered you or I, but ladies of the evening <laughs> were patrolling the streets, accosting students, and faculty members alike. No one ever admitted to me that they succumbed to that, but they talked about them being there. So, you know, it was a wild, wide open town. And maybe that was part of the charm of going back there. A convention city. Convention city. The, the Big Apple, worms and all. Right. Well, I think it was after that, uh, ex that last experience you talked about at Columbia that, that we decided to move downtown. Our mid yeah. and uh, then we went to our, our old standby, which was the Doral Inn. The Doral Inn, yes. Small old hotel that they fixed up enough so they could hold a small convention. We outgrew it. Really. Yes, we did. I always thought it was interesting that it was right across the street from the Waldorf Astoria, but it was it was it was, it was like it was uh, giving us a message that. You know, we were small potatoes in comparison to some of the other things that go on in the, in the Big Apple, but uh, we outgrew that too and moved away from from the Waldorf and the rally a couple of years ago. Well, you, you rascal, you used to get me to go over to Oscar's, which is a, a, a coffee shop at the Waldorf, to eat breakfast. And uh, we had porridge for $6 a bowl. So uh, that was really putting on a show. Uh, that very much. In the earlier days, I went to those meetings when Colonel Joseph Murphy was in charge of, of uh, the Columbia Scholastic Press Association, and he took a great liking to me, and he always kept me coming to those things, which was uh, wonderful. You'd 
set me up there on the head tables, and we would talk and chatter about things, and he served fancy meals. I still get invitations to their special awards dinners. Uh, the, uh, but we did, we did those kind of things. Um, oh, it was wonderful to get acquainted with many of those high school and college advisors, mostly from the eastern part of the country, which we didn't see at the, the other conventions. No. So I enjoyed that very much. That, uh, that was a, really a thrilling kind of experience for us. Um, some people considered you and I to be uh, leaders in escapades. That it really wasn't us, it was John Boyd. John Boyd. And, uh, uh, most of them. Yeah. I remember John Boyd uh, from one of our fall conventions. Do you remember that one in uh, Texas, down in Houston? Yeah. And what kind of uh, trouble did he get into? Well, he got us to dress up in togas and to invade a, a suite of rooms where <laughs> the people from the University of Kentucky were. You know, for some reason, or we've been great friends with the University <laughs> that's, of Kentucky that's ever true. since. That's true. The, uh, another time, he directed traffic on Halloween night in St. Louis. Uh, and he's, he found an abandoned costume and put it on so he could lead the cha-cha through the streets even though he claimed he couldn't dance. You know, John Boyd was a wonderful person, and uh, well, liked, well liked by his students, a great leader and a great teacher, and his publications were fine. Now, you and I were too stuffy, I think, most of the time. <laughs> but uh, there were all kinds of great people like that that we worked with over the years. The, uh, and we enjoyed, we enjoyed those conventions, but here I'm talking about all the good times we had, but we did great things for the students there. We gave them uh, critiques, we gave them ideas, we gave them concepts, we talked ethics, we talked about responsibility, we talked about excellence. And you know, if you look at the college publications of today, compared to the college publications of 50 years ago or 25 years ago, the improvement has just been magnificent. Now, part of that's been possible by the utilization of offset printing and phototype setting and computers. But uh, even without that wonderful technology, they began getting better and better and better, and doors opened all over the country for college students. As a matter of fact, if a person really is interested in a professional career in journalism, the best thing he or she can do is to get involved in a student publication on a college campus and become a, a contributing, effective staff member. Because when it comes time to hire, the sensible editors and publishers say, what kind of grades did you get? They don't ask that question. What kind of courses did you take? They don't ask that question. Did you work on a student newspaper? And if the answer is yes, I was editor, or managing editor, or city editor, or sports editor, well, let's talk. And the result is that most of the people that are joining the professional press are students who are strong leaders or workers on their student newspaper in, their, in college. That's the, that's the door that opens for these people. And of course, the, the coursework is helpful and, and great. But uh, I don't know about all colleges, but at Ball State we've taken the attitude that we want our graduates to be so well prepared that when they leave the campus on a Sunday commencement, Monday they can go to work on a newspaper, know what they're doing, and earn their salary from that first day on. And that, that's the kind of thing we're trying to equip our students to do. We've been successful, and other colleges have been successful at that especially since we've had the, the wonderful student publications available for them to work their way through during their college education. Um, in addition to uh, the conventions and the sessions and that type of thing that CMA and, and, and CCPA provide for students, what other things did the organization do to help student publications? Well, I have uh, summer workshops for advisors. Uh, 
for new ones and for old ones. But they take in various aspects of advising. They do a lot with financial operations because uh, most colleges don't have accountants or bookkeeping procedures that are related to what newspapers or publications do. So you have to set up your own financial operation procedure, fit it in with whatever university procedures are required, yet make it so it's a financially uh, solvable or uh, viable operation. Uh, some campus dailies are approaching the $2 million operation mark a year. Even the, our campus newspaper is getting up there in, what, $600,000 or more, which means that that's, that's a pretty good-sized operation. The uh, reason that you have difficulties is that very few campus activities that have any relationship to academic programs generate funds, but student publications do, and that's uh, something different. Uh, as a result, we've had We've had constant work that way. One of the things that we found is that some publications, because of the urging of old grads and people like that, said, well, you ought to incorporate so that the university can't control it. And we, we've done a lot of studies about that. We found that uh, incorporation in and of itself does not assure you freedom from or independence of the university. There are only a hundred or so publications that have actually done this. And some of them are quite successful, some of them aren't too successful. Uh, the University of Texas publications were incorporated for a while, but the university got disgusted with them and canceled their charter and took them back over. And, uh, and so you, you see all kinds of problems of that nature. Uh, of course, have a uncanny procedure of penetrating the corporate veil, they call it, to determine whether or not a, a student publication, incorporated or not, is truly independent of its host university. And hardly any of them can qualify as truly independent. But it makes people feel good when they say we're independent. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that under the provisions of the First Amendment and the state constitutions, the student publications in a public college cannot be controlled. The content cannot be controlled by the university or the college. Uh, maybe the, the private colleges can have more control, but fortunately about a third or more of the private colleges say, no, we're not going to do that, and they don't try to control the content. Uh, so the result is that uh, most public colleges, students enjoy freedom and independence in the publications. And quite a few private colleges, they also do. When, uh, when issues like that arise uh, before the internet, how did, uh, how did advisors get help? And what did they do besides, and, and students, uh, in the organization? A lot of telephoning, a lot of letter writing, a lot of uh, getting together, visitation from campus to campus, and organized the state press associations that have been very effective in helping people locally accommodate those things uh, and, and learn and prosper. But uh, now that the internet's here, every day, everything can be talked about, and usually is. Yes, that's right. And through those, uh, those telephone calls and letter writing and so forth, um, I guess people got to know a lot of other people. Yes. And, and uh, what, what kinds of good things did that do? Well, it, it built a tremendous professional organization, really. But it also built a tremendous personal organization. I think, in my case, I could go on to almost every college campus in the country and visit and know somebody there. Not just the advisor, but I knew a lot of the students because uh, we met with those students. We met with thousands of students every year. Now, you can't remember a thousand names, but you can surely remember a lot of things. 
and people were so glad to talk to us. I go to meetings, and someone will come up to me and say, 30 years ago I took a course from you in journalism, and look what I've been able to do. And I, I left journalism for about 20 years, but now I'm back in it. It's just amazing how, how well, we've said at our college that our students, our graduates, never really ever quite leave the campus. And I think that's true all along the way because I think the involvement of college journalism and publications people is so great that they live for that college and for what it's done for them and what they can do for it. And as a result, you have those people all over the world, all over the country, working for the, their alma mater and for their college journalism programs. And the result is that we have a tremendous uh, relationship. I don't think students in any other field are that dedicated to the college they went to or work as hard to try to do things for their colleges. You've been in this business for 40 years, 50 years, practically. No, 60 years. 60 to, years. I have to be in that. High school newspaper. Yeah. Uh, how how do you want to be remembered in terms of the CMA journalism? I wanted to say that Engelhart was a fierce and unbending champion of press freedom for college students. Uh, and I think my personality is such that I have said fierce things, and I have fought some battles here and there. Fought a few on my own campuses, fought a few on other campuses, and I've helped people win, win, win in many situations. And uh, so I, I like to have people say that. Now that's, uh, I'm so pleased that the CMA has an award that they named after me, the Engelhart First Amendment Award. And that's a joy to see that and see the kind of people that are picked winners of it. So I, I'm delighted that I've made that little niche in CMA history. Uh, but I think I'll continue battling. You know, I, I obtained a, through the CMA, uh, I obtained a, a membership on the Board of Trustees of the First Amendment Congress, and they even made me vice president of that. And my land, we've we fight for freedom of, of expression. We believe that the First Amendment belongs to everybody. And we, we're afraid that if you take it away from this person or that person, then you begin taking it away from everybody. So we're trying to get people to know the First Amendment, what it provides, how to use it, and to protect it. Because it's the center of the American way of life. And, you know, I can say that to you, and you might accept it. But there are enemies of the First Amendment. Some of them are in Congress. Some of them are in churches. Some of them are in business. Some of them are in politics. They're everywhere. But we need to keep educating people that the First Amendment is the key to being an American and living in a free country. And it leads to things like this tie. Well, that tie. Oh, my. Uh, CMA tie. Well... I don't know. I have some admirers here and there. I have some admirers at Kansas State University in Manhattan. And the other day they sent me this tie. And I'm so proud of it. Just scenes of the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And I'm so proud of it that whenever somebody brings a camera near me, I put it on <laughs> so I can show it off. And that's, uh, that's emblematic of of how we're all together in this sort of thing. There's, really, there isn't much theoretical about our belief in the First Amendment. We live it, and our students live it. Made it embedded by CMA. And the resources of CMA and the, the Student Press Law Center are at the beck and call of any advisor, any student, anywhere in this country. And they do call. Yes, they do. Thank God for that.